All three of you are lead public lives. You tell your stories publicly. You use aspects of your personal life in uh, your professional life. Mm -hmm. How do you, what is your comfort level with that? And are there things that you purposely hold back in order to you know, healthily do what you do? I'm pretty like out there. Most of my girlfriends dismay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, here's my thing. I what I I get that because I'm on the TV show and people like, they 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 think they know you. Yes, and 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 my thing is I just don't want people to think that the dream is so far away. So I try to be as accessible as I can be, and I try to be as like free and open and and also too being a, a woman a queer woman of color, I try to really show the love I have for my girlfriend and like us having a joyful life rather than somebody thinking, like, oh, if I'm gay, I'm a girl, I'm not gonna have a happy life. So that's also, it's almost sort of like living li my life publicly is a form of protest mm -hmm. in a way. Um, so I try, you know, but I definitely, there are certain things I keep to, to myself, particularly with my relationship. We try to like, you know, have some private moments as she, as she would wish. Right. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm pretty out there and pretty open. I don't really, I don't know, I don't yeah. mind it. I'm yeah, out there so, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know I mean? I'm out. I got, you know, I got my stomach out. I got my shoulders out. I got my boobs yes. out. I got everything out. You know what I mean? Because I, love it. I think it's, well, I think it's really important to the point about just being visible, mm -hmm. you know, because yeah. um, again, I, I don't know that you can really aspire if you don't see it. Right. You know, there are a lot of people who, who are looking to see, oh, well, what, what can I do? Where can I go? Mm -hmm. You know, is this place okay? And uh, I've said it a few times, which is just like, you know, if people can see me in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. being successful, then perhaps you'll come along too. Cause I'm like, mm -hmm. y'all are safe. Come on, mm -hmm. let's go. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I agree with what they just said. I think, <laughs> I think it's so wonderful for young people to come up right now and have so many different examples of what female leadership could look like. Absolutely. And I think we have a responsibility almost to just keep it all the way real so yeah. that people don't feel like they have to fit into some box of what success looks right. like. Right. Um, certainly for all three of us, we have no choice but to stand out. Like we're gonna stand out yeah. where yeah, we are. Yeah, your hair's gonna stand out, girl. Yeah. Here. <laughs> Look who's talking, I mean, her I'm hair saying. is down to here. <laughs> Uh, with no. with hot pink I'm boots like, on and, and to hide. you know animal print, we're not out here trying to hide. No, because it wouldn't work. That's <laughs> no. the thing. And at some point, I think you realize it's not going to work yeah. to try to assimilate and Correct. try to blend in. So you might as well just embrace you all. Know you know right. the hair, the earrings, the nails, all of it. I love pink it. Shoes. I try to have a private account, which I do. Well, it's like eight posts on there. I don't. I can't do two Instagram <laughs> things. Too like, much to manage. Whatever. Like, hey, this is me. We chill on a Saturday. Hold this selfie. <laughs> I'm, well, the, the fashion writer in me can't help but ask you about your style. I mean, from the fuchsia boots to, you know, the off-white Nikes, I mean, you know, Air Jordan. Right? And the hat. Let's not forget the hat. I know. 40 acres and a mule. This is the Come blackest on. outfit that ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't even, it wasn't on purpose. Like, this is just like, these are the pieces. It's like, here we go. Um... <laughs> But no, but that being said, all oh, seriousness. I'm gonna, well, what, what, what does <laughs> no, your I, style say about you? What does my style say about Wow, it says that I'm a very proud black person um, <laughs> who's a fan of Waiting to Exhale. I mean, <laughs> best movie of all time. It's so dope. But I mean, but, but I think too, it's like, I think I have a lot of fun with fashion and um, I, I really, really enjoy it. I, I've kind of fallen off on the outfit pick days on Instagram for those that follow, I've fallen off, but I'm trying to get back on. But you know, <laughs> but like this, for example, like this, this coat, which I think is pretty dope. It was, it was sent to me, but and I, I'm a believer in wearing up and coming designers. Mm -hmm. And this is um, designed by one by the name is Nicole Wilson. You can find her on Instagram called by Nicole uh, Wilson, I believe, but you can search her, Nicole Wilson. And she's a queer woman of color. And, and that's important to me to rock her art. You know, and I did, I wore it on the Daily Show on purpose. Mm. So that way, if somebody says, oh, hey, where'd you get the coat? I saw it on our Daily Show, like, oh, this young lady over here, mm -hmm. like, please follow her and please support what she's doing. Um, you know, and then, of course, I'll mix that in, like, you know, I got to represent the Virgil, the Off-White. I mean, that's just like Chicago and, you know, and it's, you know, that's just, that's just fun. But to me, you know, uh, that, like, I want to I wanna wear pieces by people that are on the come up. That's important as well. 
What about you, Buzzma? I mean, yeah, I make, I make choices all the time. You know, last year um, I presented on the Apple keynote stage um, and I made a choice to wear a dress you know, which maybe others would be like, oh, well, that's not really a choice. Like, don't you wear a dress all the time? I'm like, no, but that is a choice because that's not something I'd seen every day on that stage. Mm. And um, for me, it's really oh, wow. important. Yeah, it's, it's important, again, for visibility's sake to be able to express myself fully, you know, and even to the conversation we were having earlier that, you know, very, very much like you just said, I, I enjoy it. You know, I like mm -hmm. to express myself through my clothing and through how I appear in the world. And so I just want to show up like me every day. Mm -hmm. You know, what someone once said to me that um, she was often, when, when she was working with women who um, sort of had a lot of money and they would often come in and they would just be in head to toe, designer, practically couture, uh -huh. the whole shebang. And she said that it was like, fashion as, as, as power, oh. that they would mm. walk in just dressed to the nines and it was a really intimidating thing. And I'm wondering if you ever sort of think about fashion as a kind of, as, as empowerment, as a tool to um, sort of state your presence. Absolutely. I mean, Elaine, you can I mean in. well, I can definitely speak to hair and beauty being that in my personal journey. I think like growing up, there was so, so much of my energy was spent trying to blend in and, and like force my hair into submission, trying <laughs> to straighten it so that I felt beautiful. And if I had a big moment, a special moment, the only way I felt special is if I altered what was natural. <laughs> um, and I think in, over time, as I've embraced my identity as a black woman and, and felt much more comfortable in my skin, I, my hair has just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger <laughs> and bigger. And so by the time I started at Teen Vogue as the beauty director um, five years ago, when the first headline hit that I got that job, it wasn't like Elaine Welteroth got the job. It was first black beauty director in Kanye Nas history. And I certainly didn't sign up for that. I didn't know about. I didn't know that that's that I was that that role would be making history. Yeah. But it made me think about the impact that I could have and the responsibility uh -huh. that I had to show up as my full self. Because no one who looks like me, no one with my point of view, no one who's come from where I've come from, has ever been in this seat before. So I remember making like kind of having a. a mind like a like a shift a shift in perspective taking that seat and and just being like i'm here i have arrived no more assimilating no more trying to fit in um and the very first story that i did be, and I, it's important because i think i recognize wait I, it's not just me I'm, I'm bringing to the table, I'm bringing an entire community that hasn't right. been spoken directly to. Right. Yeah. Um, and so what are the stories that only I can tell? I can tell a really good black hair story because I have one, you know? And so <laughs> right. that, was the that was the first, that was, that was my first story at Teen Vogue was talking about my hair journey and embracing my, my curls. And, and I was like, so for my first day at Teen Vogue, my new mantra is the, the, bigger, the bigger the hair, the better. And now, and now I literally, did, I got an afro. I just learned how to do this about a month ago. But doing this in the fashion industry at Condé Nast with Anna Wintour is in some ways, like you say, it's, it's, it's activism. Mm -hmm. Beauty can be a form of activism. Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, can I just say for a second that um, Miss Jackson from the Chicago Tribune told me today that she believes this is the first time all black women have been on the main stage. Really? Oh. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. Is this long? I mean, I love it. Hey, hey. <laughs> First, 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 first. I mean, come on, say it again. I'm with it. One more time. First, first, first. For first, those in first. the back. <laughs> That's what we do. We break barriers every day. Well, I'm, I'm curious, what, who inspires you? What stories inspire you? Hmm. I mean, I was, I was told that you were particularly moved um, when you were at the new uh, Museum of African American History hmm. and Culture. Absolutely. And had the chance to go into the Emmett Till Chapel. Yeah. But that was particularly moving. It was extremely moving. Um, 
And I think, again, being from Chicago, how that's such a part of our history. Mm -hmm. um, I remember hearing the stories when I was very young, and I'm very grateful for that, because not every family does that. And there's a, re and there's a character named Emmett, if you've seen the, t the shy teaser trailer. Um, I, I named the character Emmett for that, for that very mm -hmm. reason, so that way his legacy continues to live on, and so mm -hmm. that way, even if kids just are saying the name and don't know the history, at least we're still speaking his name. Um, I think that's important. Um, you know, I, and, and thank you for bringing that up because I mean, it, it's, to go there with my family, um, it was a really powerful experience yeah. to know, and I'm very aware of the ancestors. Like I know that they were standing up on the Emmy stage with me. They were with me on the plane mm -hmm. to go to LA. I'm very aware of them. I feel them daily and I'm so grateful to them because they bowed so that we wouldn't have to. Mm. And so mm -hmm. that really inspires me constantly, you know, to think that I could be living this life. You know, we really are our ancestors' wildest dreams and I'm honored to be- Beyond them. Be, be way beyond. Yeah. Or maybe not, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Um, you know, like I, maybe they foresaw this mm. um, in the slave quarters. Um, and I'm just grateful to, to be sitting here, to be doing what I do, and to have, you know, the platform that I have. Because I, I, it, I, it, I will always use it for good. And for, and just to always be an activist, just even in just, even with humor, even with just being myself, even with just being an out black woman in the industry, because I know that my presence will, ch will, will spark ideas for people that are coming up behind me. And that the people that c are coming up behind me that are working and all that kind of stuff, these young people that have these great voices, that inspires me. Because I, I'm not gonna be here forever. Mm -hmm. I want them to be inspired by what I'm doing. Hopefully that somebody 20, 30 years from now will be sitting here and be talking about, oh, I saw Lena and it made me wanna go do this thing. Because I think great art begets great art. You know, I love the story about John Singleton saying, I saw I do the right thing, went home and wrote Boys in the Hood. Mm -hmm. The Hughes brothers saw Boys in the Hood, went home and wrote Menace of Society. We have to make great shit. Mm -hmm. So that way others will say, okay, it's possible. Because Moonlight's doing that, Get Out's doing that. All these other things, they're telling people like, go make something dope and don't care what nobody else says. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna get somebody else, you're gonna inspire somebody else to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I want you, you guys to be able to, to answer the same question, but I also would just sort of throw out there something that you said that I think is so important, which is that the art that you do, the story that you tell about yourself, allows other people to be, their, to be individuals, mm -hmm. that they don't have to be part of just sort of this monolith. Right. They can be nuanced and quirky and eccentric and all the things that they individually are. Yeah. But I mean, who inspires you? Oh, what stories daughter, inspire you? My daughter, Liel, inspires me. Mm. Um, she's such a wonderful little person. You know, if she wasn't my kid, she'd be my friend. Oh. For real. <laughs> yeah, she's dope. She's a dope girl. Uh, no, How she doesn't. You? She's eight. I love it. Yeah, she's so cute. <laughs> um, no, she really does inspire me because, um, you know, I, I mean, I just refuse to have her face the same things I'm facing now. Hmm. I refuse. Okay. It won't happen, okay. you know? And so when and I you, have... And when you say the things that you're facing now, what do you mean? Yes, I, I mean the struggles in which we are, we are currently existing. Uh -huh. I do believe that, you know, the ancestors are, are with us as well uh -huh. uh, and that their hopes, dreams, aspirations are why we are sitting here today. Yeah. And if they didn't hope those things and wish those things and work towards those things, we wouldn't have these opportunities. Right. And so for me, I am doing the same thing. I look at her, I pray over her, I demand for her that the world be better. That's mm. right. Mm. That's real. Mm. Well, Man, um, how do you follow that? <laughs> Ancestors, all I mean, um, go. Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> Jesus. Like Prince. Just like that me up. Yeah, Prince. Michael Jackson. Right. <laughs> Prince. All right, well, let me channel God real fast. <laughs> no, um, I, honestly, what inspires me, uh, this is going to sound cliche, being the editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue, but it's the truth, young people. Mm -hmm. Every time I meet a group of young people, I recognize 
how... Elaine, you're like 21. I'm 30. <laughs> Let's be clear. I'm a grown woman. Younger. <laughs> I'm grown. Younger. Thank you. No. Younger. I, listen, I recognize that I'm not, you know, I got an old soul. Okay. <laughs> Robin. We can see with the phone. Yes. You understand. Yeah. Um, but no, when I, when I talk to people like Yara Shahidi, for instance, who mm, is Yara's plays though. Zoe on yes. Blackish, yes. um, I pattern. see the future. I see someone who is light years ahead of where I was at her age. Mm. She is so self-possessed. She is so brilliant. She is going to make this world a better place. And so my hope is with them. And I feel like I have a responsibility to invest in those minds and to lift people like her up as examples of, of what, what, what it means to be cool today. Right. It's not this falling out of cars drunk, um, which is what I grew up looking at as celebrities and young mm -hmm. people that were on the covers of magazines. Right, I didn't have Yara Shahidi as a, a, member, as a, yeah. as a role model. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's gonna change culture. That's gonna change how, how young women carry themselves. Yeah. Um, and and I, I always say, I'm like, I can't wait. I'm gonna be the first person to endorse her as a presidential candidate one day. <laughs> I really think she, people like her, young people like her, Rowan, Amanda Listenberg, they're gonna change the world for the better. So when I feel distraught about where we are politically right now, Mm. Um, I just think about, I just, I try to step back and remember that the silver lining is this generation of, you know, Gen Z, they're not going to stand for this. And when they are in the position to vote, this is, this whole, get ready, because w this is going to, the world's going to be such a better place. Yeah. Um, and in some ways, I think it was actually necessary. I think this moment in, in culture is, is necessary because folks like Yara, who are 18 right now, they're, they grew up with Obama as their president. That was, that, Norm. that was normalized for right. them. Mm -hmm. So this is even crazier to them. And, but they needed that wake-up call that we, we have not arrived. We have much more work to do. And they are awake. They're woke, they're, yeah, yeah. they're out in the streets. Yeah. And, it, and it's, it's so heartening to me because when I was growing up, I think there was this, there was just this um, apathy. Mm. And, and I remember reading about the 60s and reading about Angela Davis and feeling like I missed out on a moment. Like, no one, like, like, where, like why aren't there, no one's in the streets. No one's fighting for progress. And listen, it's a double-edged sword. I wish we weren't facing what we are today. But mm. one thing that's beautiful about it is that people are People are coming together. They're, 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 we're protesting for change. We are actually pushing progress, and we're looking at our blind spots. They're undeniable. They're, un, you can, they're unavoidable. Um, and so that inspires me. And I think that this moment is going to produce such great art. Right. Like I can't wait oh, to yeah. see the, what comes out of you, and you, and the next, and you, and the next, in the next year and two years. I think that sometimes the most political times that pu produce the purest and the like the richest. Yeah. most necessary art. I mean, yes. Do you think that in some ways it was that very strange combination, that back-to-back -back of Obama-Trump mm -hmm. that created this tension out of which interesting art, interesting progress changes have grown? Oh. Well, I hope we don't need that kind of friction right. to see great art <laughs> ever again in life. You know what I mean? Not that we like need again. it, but that it <laughs> perhaps has been a byproduct. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That means because I definitely I'm in the space now. I was like, just, I just wrote a feature, and it's very much protest art. You know, mm. that's how it feels. Um, and who knows if I would have written it if it were a different climate. Um, but I think, look, you know, Baldwin wrote during times of unrest in this country. Um, so did Zora. Langston, absolutely. So I think, you know. I love that you're on a first name basis with You me. know. <laughs> they, 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 they inspire me daily. I keep their pictures in their books, you know, constantly. You know, I was reading a lot of Baldwin when I was writing uh, The Shy, actually. 
Um, so just trying to channel that thing of like, again, he's trying to capture humanity during his time period, and I was trying to capture it during mine. And so, but I think that's the thing that does inspire artists. It's like when the world around us is sort of burning down, we're in our apartments documenting it, you know, through fictitious characters, sometimes not. But I really do believe like we're in a time of, it is a resurgence, it is a, a renaissance. You know, with ta Coates, you know, like pumping out these Atlantic articles and these phenomenal books and, you know, <laughs> that I read and, you know, highlight and take notes and, and uh, be like, yes, you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, that's so important. Like, you know, he really has filled that space, that ball in one's hell, you know, for, for, for people. But even like, you know, it's like so funny because like Justin Simeon, who did Dear White People, whom I love, like he can't look at, he was looking at Spike Lee and all this kind of stuff. And so now he's sort of doing his own version of sort of a school days with Dear White People. It's like each generation affects the other. And so what I find to be cool, you're talking about young people, how cool is it that the young people today, they do have Atlanta, they do have Dear White People, they go in the movie seeing stuff like, like Moonlight and, and Get Out, and, like, and that's the norm for them. They're like, yeah, this is dope, what, what's, what's that? And the cool thing is the stuff that they're gonna be making, you know, 10 years from now when they come of age and they're ready to kind of do their own thing, it'll be even more next level. And so I think that's why we have to always be striving for greatness and constantly raging against the machine. Um, because the thing I was thinking about earlier, because this is, I was just sort of in the deep space about it. I was like, why is it that, just thinking about our, our bodies, our brown bodies, particularly when they're lifeless, sometimes morph into matches that spark movements. Mm. Why not appreciate us when we're alive? No. Um, because Emmett Till was a sacrificial lamb. Mm. Trayvon Martin, was also a sacrificial lamb. And we rocking the t-shirts with his face on it, where it's almost like now he becomes a symbol of a new movement. But, it, but it sh he shouldn't have to die for us to know his name. Hmm. Same thing with Mike Brown and Aaron Gardner. They're, to me, I just want their, their bodies to be valid, even when their hearts are still beating. And, um, and I just kind of feel like that's my hope is that we, we can stop, that you don't, we don't have to kill us in order to appreciate us. Mm.